tonight, tonight is also a very special night for us uh, because it is the night of our annual uh, AIAS, that's the American Institute of Architecture Students Organization, uh, their auction uh, that benefits a couple of their causes, the primary one of which is Freedom by Design. And to explain just briefly what that's all about, I'd like to introduce uh, the former president of AIAS, but now this year's chair of the auction, Jonathan Sebelek. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I was told I only had 90 seconds to do this, and those of you who know me know that's not going to be easy. Um, okay. Uh, see? Lights? All right, so I just wanted to talk for a second about Freedom by Design. Um, what Freedom by Design is, is uh, the, the American Institute of Architecture Students um, nonprofit community service organization. Well, basically what it does is take uh, architecture students and give them opportunities to uh, develop and build solutions for people who have limited mobility within their homes. Um, this is a little bit about uh, the organization. I'm just gonna go on to the the client we're working with right now is uh, the Sane family. Um, Mr. Sane has had a couple strokes and uh, is most likely bound to a wheelchair for the rest of his life. Unfortunately, his home just doesn't work for uh, that situation. So we have a group of students this year, which is almost 20 people, hmm. uh, that have been working uh, designing solutions for him to get inside the home, which is the first in a number of uh, uh, projects that we have to do at this house. So I wanted to show a little bit about the existing condition. Um, the walk up to the, uh, the, well, the approach up to the front door is um, obviously not very friendly for someone who's bound to a wheelchair. Uh, he can't get up the front step and then there's the threshold on the door. Um, we've been working over the last couple months uh, doing charrettes and getting critiques and uh, um, kind of modifying plans and finding out which would work best for the family. Um, oh, that was supposed to be this slide. <laughs> so uh, we, did, we did a couple critiques and we just got uh, the budget approved and all the, uh, the permits in order and we're about to build, actually uh, this weekend we're gonna start the build. Um, and then there's one slide that shows a little bit about what we've proposed, um, which is ultimately eliminating the step completely. It turns out it was only about a four inch rise to, uh, to get from the walk into the, up to the threshold. Um, and there was enough room there to extend the ramp long enough that we didn't even need a handrail. And that turned out to be what the client wanted. So um, this one is a pretty minimalist solution, but it's the one that worked out best for the client. And uh, we get to start on this this weekend. So if you're interested, uh, you could ask any one of us. Most of the guys are wearing blue, t or blue shirts and we'll be able to talk to you about Freedom by Design. Um, also, the auction is going to remain open after the lecture. So if you're interested in going up and checking out some of the items we have during the fundraiser, uh, you will be able to bid on items after the lecture as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, for those of you that are students, uh, Jonathan didn't mention that there are some items that are reserved specifically for you, students and young architects, because we wanted you all to be involved in the auction. Uh, so we encourage you all to go take a look at it. Did, you, didn't, you don't have to buy a ticket to go take a look. We've closed three items now in the auction. Uh, for people that had tickets, all the rest of the, of the items are still open uh, for about uh, 15, 20 minutes after, after this event. And uh, just so that I let you know, uh, there will be a dessert reception afterwards for as long as the dessert lasts. This is a big crowd. Uh, so, so get to it very, very quickly. And uh, there should be a sign-up sheet just outside for those of you that are architects. Uh, you can get AIA continuing education credit for this lecture. So with that said, uh, let me introduce uh, our host for the night, uh, Professor A. Alfred Taubman, to introduce our speaker. Well, that was impressive. Obviously, they found a way to break down threshold resistance. <laughs> Our guest lecturer this evening 
is architect Michael Graves. Modestly describes himself as a general practitioner. Others, in the, like the New York Times critic Paul Groberger, describes him as truly the most original voice American architecture has provided in some time. Actually, Michael Graves defines simple labels. While he's considered the dean of postmodern architectural movement, he may be best known for the playful teapot he designed for Target stores. Recognizing as an outstanding professor, he taught architecture at Princeton University for 40 years. And his drawings, which is a central approach to architectural design, have been exhibited at the Whitney, Cooper Hewitt, and the Berlin Museums. And while the architectural firm was founded in 1964, has designed exteriors and interiors of many of the world's most admired municipal buildings, museums, and corporate headquarters around the world. You may have experienced his work firsthand during his stay at the Swan or the Dolphin Hotels at Disney World in Orlando. So I'll now attempt to label my good friend, Michael Graves, other than to say, is one of the most created and gifted men I've ever met. And for all the designers, architects, and planners in the audience this evening, I would add that he's an extraordinary role model. Michael entered his undergraduate degree in architecture at the University of Cincinnati and a Master of Architecture from Harvard University. He studied art and architecture at the American Academy in Rome. For Michael Graves, design begins with an understanding of people. In an essay titled, A Case of Figurative Architecture, Michael writes about the relationship of the human figure in architectural form, arguing that good design is based on man's social psych physical occupation of the environment. I had the opportunity to witness personal philosophy firsthand here in Detroit, working with Michael as the renovation and expansion of the Detroit Institute of Arts, focusing on people navigate the museum and respond to the art of the collections we were able to dramatically improve the visitor experience at the DIA. While adding exhibit space and addressing a number of serious structural problems throughout the historic building, the walls were falling off. Michael and his firm began their work with the DIA in 1988, assisting with the master plan and guiding us along with Smith Group through completion of our renovation and expansion in 2007. When most people think about work of Michael Graves and associates, they think of such distinctive projects as the Portland Building in Oregon, Minneapolis Institute of Arts, Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas, the U.S. Courthouse in Washington, D.C., and the, court, uh, the corporate headquarters of Humana in Louisville. But when I think of space, I work in every day. Michael designed the interiors of my Bloomfield Hills and New York offices, including much of the furniture. So a good thing I like his work. <laughs> and I'm not the only one. Over the years, Michael Graves and Associates has been honored with the awards for excellence, and Michael's been recognized with the gold medal of the American Institute of, Stu of, uh, uh, of Architects and the National Medal of Arts from the President of the United States. 
a very generous and civic-minded man. Michael is honorary chairman of Freedom by Design, which of course was the auction of the program of the American Institute of Architectural Students. The national campaign on, make, on making our built space more welcoming and accessible to people with physical challenges. And Michael is helping us this evening with that auction to raise funds for this important initiative. Friends, it's a special honor for me to be able to introduce Michael Graves to the Lawrence Tech community. We are in the presence of genius. So please join me in welcoming one of the most important general practitioners of the last century, my friend Michael Graves. I think we can go home now. Actually, that was terrific, Alfred. Um, I loved it. There's, there's a seat here, and probably some others around, and a couple over there. I hate it when people, are, you know, for a four hour lecture, you shouldn't have to sit on the. <laughs> that was just a worry, Judy Talbot. Um, anyway, I need to know one thing. How many architects here tonight? Oh, shit. <laughs> Okay, so I know who I'm talking to. I the architects in the audience, I got the boss in the front seat, two front seats, a big boss in front of him. Okay, um, I'd better behave. I know that some of you in the back can't see me, but that isn't important. I could, I could get up on my fancy chair on two wheels, which is really a spectacular thing, <laughs> if you really wanted me to. But I, I will stay down for a little while. Uh, only because I'm afraid I'd run out of battery. And that's a bad thing to do. Um, I'm talking tonight about the Grand Tour. The Grand Tour is a period of time uh, that was taken by architects, sculptors, painters, dilettantes, and mostly the 18th and 19th century, even though there was some in the 17th century. There were these people who were generally English, came to uh, Europe um, and from the island of, of England and Scotland and Wales. And they traveled through Europe, usually starting their trip in Egypt. From Egypt, they went to Greece, from Greece, they went to Naples and around Mesopotamia and then on to the body of the boot in Italy and visited all of the great cities in Italy, ending up generally in Naples. And the reason they did that is that there were so many sculptors and artists that had drawn the monuments and wanted to take home as their colleagues had, small versions of these things that were being dug out of the ground all through Italy, as well as Pompeii and Herculaneum. And it was an exciting, wonderful time for these people. Unlike the rest of us today who go in jetliners and stay for two weeks and come home, they stayed for three or four years and often walked from one site to the other. There are many, many books on the Grand Tour and all of their troubles and where they slept and where they didn't sleep and what they encountered and those that made it and didn't make it. There were, there were a lot of sort of villains on the, on the trip for many of them. So it wasn't an easy thing. In, in 1960, I won the Prix de Rome and went to Rome for two years. That was my grand tour. 
I had, as Alfred said, I went, as you know him here, uh, Mr. Taubman. Um, Alfred went, uh, or Alfred said I went to the University of Cincinnati uh, and to Harvard. At Cincinnati, uh, I learned how to do Mies van der Rohe. And at Harvard, I learned how to do Le Corbusier. And I graduated from those two fine institutions without knowing either who Proust was or who Palladio was. That's a problem. <laughs> That's a big problem. Um, how to express my distaste for my time at Harvard would be difficult, um, <laughs> to say the least. I was so excited to get there. I was so excited they let me in. Um, and surprised. And I wouldn't, didn't go to set the world on fire, but I, I didn't go for the, what was to greet me, which was a, a small Spanish man named Jose Luis Sert. We, we sat on stools. This was a, a form of punishment. We sat on high stools in the drafting room with desks that were from the turn of the century which were wonderful, actually. Um, and why I say that is that Dean Sert was a very small man. He was called Teeny Deeny Weeny. Um, <laughs> I was never Dean at Princeton for that very reason. I never wanted to be called middle to anything. So I, I wasn't and didn't, and I was happy I, I didn't do that. But Nevertheless, I, I loved my classmates. They met me on the first day in school, and I was very bushy-tailed and ready and eager to work. And one of them sauntered up to me in a blue sport coat with no shirt. It was September. Um, yellow uh, silk pants, no socks, alligator loafers, You've seen him on the street. I know you have. Big tan, big, big time tan. He had a bigger tan than John Boehner. And, uh, that's going a lot. Um, think about that on next Tuesday, OK? All right. Now, I promise I won't do that again. Uh, I know I'm going to upset some of you. But I shouldn't. You should use your brains. Um, so anyway, uh, he said, looked at me, and he said, Midwest, right? And I said, looked at him, and I said, right, Park Avenue, right? He said, Madison Avenue. And I said, got it. He became my best friend. He's never worked a day in his life. His family makes uh, grape juice that we all know and love. And, and he was just satisfying his father, I suppose. But, Anyway, I, from that, I thought this is going to be an interesting time here at Harvard. It got to be very raucous at times, and I worked very hard, and it didn't matter how hard you worked as long as you did Le Corbusier. And, and the dean would say to you, nothing else but, when he would look at your drawing, and he'd say something like, Mr. Gray's a little more animation. What does that mean? <laughs> a little more animation. All right. Well, we've seen what that dean did in dormitories for Boston University and Boston College. As you go along the, chi chi the Charles River, you see animated buildings. <laughs> um, anyway, here I am, on an early day at the academy. I'm. I'm starting to draw, which I've done all my life, and sat there tonight at uh, a table drawing with Alfred, who was drawing himself. I, <laughs> he brought six books, such a shyster. He brought <laughs> six books. He wouldn't sign more than six books. And after he had finished his signature and his little picture of himself, he would nudge me and he said, don't draw anymore. Don't draw. You're making me look bad. Don't draw anymore. 
I kept drawing. It was so much fun to keep, keep drawing. Anyway, um, so thank you all. You were all very sweet in the things you said to both of us. We enjoyed it thoroughly. Uh, really, we did. And I'm here drawing on, as I say, one of my early days, uh, going from my time at Harvard, working in New York for a year, and then trying for the Rome Prize and winning it, luckily. And we're let out on the street by the director who insisted that we represent America with a tie. I had never got that remark again until I went to the Detroit Athletic Club today. <laughs> and I walked, rolled, I always say walk, so just, I've only been paralyzed for seven years, so I, in my dreams I walk, I play golf in my dreams, I do everything I walk, so don't pity me. Anyway, I walked through one dining room and there were some younger guys there who had no tie on, and I said, oh, thank God. I got to the old boy's room, and here came, a, I have a blue shirt on today, and a blue tie came, and I said, more John Boehner. And <laughs> you don't wear a blue tie with a blue shirt. So anyway, I tied a sloppy knot, and, and I got through it. So here it is. I want to go to the, the first slide, which was a big surprise for me. And here we are, I don't know who took this picture, but we're at the front door of the American Academy. The American Academy owns 11 acres. A building here designed on the Janiculum Hill, which is a, surprisingly the highest hill in Rome, overlooking the city and the French Academy. I didn't do that. <laughs> the French Academy was the first academy and it was during the time of Angra and others had that uh, were there as painters and sculptors, young architects, in the Beaux-Arts. I, I have to apologize to you for today, because tonight I lectured for Alfred for about an hour. I think my voice may go out after the third or three and a half, three and a half hours of tonight. So <laughs> you shouldn't worry, I won't talk too long. Um, but I can feel it already. But this was the Academy, and I, the first day, I was brought by a, a, a friendly bus to this spot right here, walked in, never knew that this would be my studio up here in this corner, and that would be my terrace. Couldn't, I'm a Hoosier. I mean, I don't deserve <laughs> this kind of treatment. So in I walked, and that's not English, I walked in and through these wonderful gates, which are always closed now. Our world is different. And there's a guard there to put you through the, the machines and so on. But nevertheless, in my day, it was open. And into the foyer, which is open as well. That's the first moment I realized I was in Rome. And you didn't have to have a window on every, uh, on every a glass in every window no doors on every opening. And so this is open and there's a wonderful fountain over here that's, you can't see the little trickle of water in it, but we'll get back to that in a moment. And up those stairs into the loggia, and I never knew at the time that I would be asked, I don't know, a hundred years later to design um, the rare books room for the academy inside those doors. In 1910, when this building was built, 12 actually, 1912, um, that was the entry to the library. Where we're standing taking this picture was the entry to the Salone, as they called it, the living room of the academy. And on the left is a courtyard. So the, the loggia goes around the four sides of the courtyard and continues in the basement as a cryptoporticus. And that is a marvelous, marvelous, wonderful space, I think, taken right out of Hadrian's Villa. And, and here are a piece of sculpture done by one of the academicians in the 20s. And then over here on the wall, painted terracotta. Terracotta because it was the ground level, the ground level being from the earth. 
therefore something to give the building weight at the bottom. And as you went higher, as Chi Yipolo would tell us later with blue skies and his murals and his great celestial soffits, wonderful kinds of lightness of the churches that he painted. But here the weight of first the, the wainscoat uh, that you see, uh, a series of benches around the edge for contemplation, like the monks uh, that we were supposed to be. And then these, these what the Italians call spogli, the spoils of ruins that are brought to sites like this, put up on the wall when people within that institution, like the American Academy, are involved in the digs. So where you see these kinds of spogli in Rome usually has a meaning to suggest that, that there are are people there that are, and, and finds within that site generally uh, where, where some of these plaques and, and figures have been found. In the library of the academy, uh, I would take myself uh, most every night. A little story, uh, the academy is wonderful. You have breakfast, uh, sort of catch as catch can, and a small series of small tables. And then you have lunch generally outside of, of, the, of the academy in the city, but you can have it at the academy. And dinner is held, except for the weekends, in the dining room of the, of the academy. A table that holds about 30 people. These people are classical scholars. They're people your age or a little older in my case. Classical scholars, Renaissance scholars, musicians, artists, sculptors, and the like. But every academic discipline you can think of, and writers as well from the American uh, Academy of Arts and Letters sends one or two a year. And as these people started talking in the evening, and remember what I said about my education, the last thing I wanted to do was to talk with them. I wanted to listen. It's a good thing I did because I didn't know that my discipline was a language. As I told you, I didn't know squat about Palladio or, or Proust. And that's, to send somebody to an institution like this made of scholars, that's a, a, a daunting task. But as you see, this library is a marvelous, marvelous, wonderful room filled with all the Palladio and all the Michelangelo and all the Leonardo you could ever want. You can, you can take those great elephant folders out, put them on the tables. You could trace with, with yellow trace. You could, you could redraw. You could read and read and read, which I did for two years. So in the second year, I felt I could join the conversation. As we all say, I went on charrette. But not charrette to draw more buildings, but to find out what I, as an architect, was meant to do.